This program is made possible by grants from Humanities Kansas and the Sunflower Foundation in partnership with the Gary County Historical Society. This is Pandemic on the Prairie, a podcast about the 1918 influenza pandemic in Kansas and what local stories tell us about the American experience more broadly. I'm your host, Kara Heights. Join me as we learn about this important moment in history and perhaps through the past, come to better understand the present. So if you take the self-guided walking tour of Haskell Indian Nations University on the edge of Lawrence, Kansas, you'll be directed past the typical highlights of a university campus. Old buildings on various registries of historic places, halls named after important people, a sports complex, the dining hall, dormitories, the student union. I could go on, but you get the idea. From this perspective, it looks like a standard small college campus. But then you start to notice who the buildings are named after. Hiawatha, Tecumseh, Pontiac, Blue Eagle, Pushmataha, Pocahontas. These are not the names of donors to the school carved in stone. This is a campus that deeply celebrates Native American history, even in the very names etched on the sides of its buildings. But there is one part of campus not listed on the official walking tour, a space that stands out because it's quite unusual to see one at a university. However, this site tells a story central to the history of the school and to the history of the relationship between Native Americans and the U.S. government, the cemetery. Today, if you visit the cemetery, you'll see an eight-foot-tall wrought iron fence surrounding the headstones. It was installed a few years ago after a vandal pulled some of the grave markers out of the ground. Over 100 students are buried in this cemetery. All of them died between 1885 and 1943. And as you walk around, you'll see communicable diseases as a common cause of death, such as tuberculosis, typhoid fever, pneumonia, and influenza. I asked Eric Anderson about this cemetery on Haskell campus and how it connects to the influenza epidemic. Professor Anderson is chair of the Indigenous and American Studies program at Haskell and is a member of the Citizen Potawatomi Nation. From its earliest, earliest days, students are dying. Um, There's a graveyard on the campus. I think, you know, that's an unusual situation. You wouldn't find a lot of schools uh, where you have a cemetery on premises, but you do find that at Indian schools. And those are just the ones who never went home. And of course, they're shipping bodies, corpses of deceased students back home in numbers that probably we'll never exactly know. But that institutional environment and the dormitory style living uh, makes it absolutely right for any kind of contagion you know, to burn through there like a wildfire. So it's a, it's going to be a pretty dire situation when something like the flu epidemic hits. It's going to, you know, it's going to go off like a bomb, but you know, the graveyard reflects that. It's right near my office, so I, I see it every day. It's a pretty strong reminder of the history of the school. We'll talk more with Professor Anderson in our next mini episode, so stay tuned for that. So how do students dying from influenza at what was called at the time the Haskell Institute fit into the larger story of the 1918 to 1920 pandemic in Kansas? So in a previous episode, we looked at the influenza outbreak in March of 1918 at Camp Funston, the part of Fort Riley in Kansas that was training troops for World War I. And we explored the theory that the flu was brought to Camp Funston from Haskell County in southwest Kansas, and that this Haskell County strain of the flu might have been the origin of the first wave of the influenza pandemic. But when I hear the word Haskell in connection to Kansas, I think of two places, Haskell County and Haskell Indian Nations University in Lawrence. Oddly enough, Both Haskells play an important role in the larger story of the influenza epidemic in Kansas. Today we'll be telling the story of the other Haskell, not the county, 
but Haskell Indian Nations University, known at the time as the Haskell Institute, a boarding school for Native Americans. The Haskell Institute experienced a severe outbreak in March around the time of the first wave of the flu at Camp Funston. To help tell this story, we'll be talking with Michaela Adams, Assistant Professor of Native American History at the University of Mississippi. Perhaps this is the earliest recorded civilian outbreak in, in the entire world. Around one third of the students were hospitalized during the outbreak and 17 died. The Haskell Institute also suffered badly during the second deadly wave of the flu pandemic in the fall of 1918, as did many Native American communities at the time. And this outbreak at the Haskell Institute is one of the only recorded civilian outbreaks of the first wave of the flu pandemic in the U.S. So how did the flu get to the Haskell Institute just a couple weeks after the outbreak at Camp Funston? And is it possible a major piece of evidence for an early flu outbreak at Haskell County was actually referring to the Haskell Institute? And why are there so many Haskells in Kansas? It's kind of confusing. We'll explore these questions and more with Professor Adams. Professor Adams is currently working on a research project entitled Influenza in Indian Country, Indigenous Sickness, Suffering, and Survival During the 1918 to 1920 Pandemic. I started this project um, about, I guess I started research about four years ago, so I've been working on it for a while um, and just, you know, had no concept that we would now be living through a pandemic as well. We'll discuss with Professor Adams what these outbreaks can tell us about the failure of public health programs for Native Americans in the early 20th century. Indigenous people in the continental United States died at a rate nearly four times as high as the rest of the population. We'll hear stories of students and parents trying to assert their rights within an often discriminatory system. And we'll consider some parallels between the influenza pandemic and the current COVID pandemic in regards to Native Americans. So for a bit of background, I asked Professor Adams to recount a brief history of the Haskell Institute from its founding up until the influenza pandemic. So, yeah, as the Indian Wars were, were winding to a close in the late 19th century, so there were groups of Eastern reformers who began looking for a new federal Indian policy that would be more humane and less violent than some of the policies directed towards Indian people in the past. And so they started to push for Native Americans to be assimilated into American society, which they saw, again, as this humane alternative to racial extermination, which was an alternative proposed by some people at the time. Um, but assimilation policy was, was what they came up with, and this involved more or less a three-prong approach. So first, they planned to destroy tribal governments and tribal legal systems by extending federal jurisdiction over reservation lands. And they did this by asserting Congress's plenary power to override previous treaties that had guaranteed indigenous independence. And then second, the reformers then endeavored to break up Indian land bases through the allotment of reservations into these individually owned plots of land or homesteads. And this they hoped would teach Indians to value private property and then would encourage them to participate in America's growing capitalist economy in the late 19th century. And then finally, reformers also endeavored to assimilate indigenous children culturally by placing them into these federally run boarding schools. And they thought that in these boarding schools, children could be taught American values, uh, American culture. And they thought that this would hopefully um, turn uh, these Indian children into productive American citizens. Now, the first federal Indian boarding school in this period was the Carlisle Indian Industrial School, which was established in Pennsylvania in 1879. Um, but then soon after that, they, they began to establish other federal Indian boarding schools as well. And one of these was the Haskell Institute, which was established um, five years after Carlisle in 1884 in Lawrence, Kansas. Um, and by the time of the influenza pandemic, where you know my research recently has, has looked at, uh, by that time, Haskell had become sort of the largest and most prominent Indian uh, boarding school off reservation um, in, the, in the country at the time. Professor Adams, can you tell us about what happened at the Haskell Institute in March of 1918? So yeah, the Haskell Institute experienced um, sort of the first civilian outbreak that we know of, of the first wave of the influenza pandemic of 1918 to 1920. And perhaps it's, it's the earliest recorded civilian outbreak in, in the entire world. Um, uh, there are lots of reports of, uh, of 
outbreaks of influenza in military camps in, in March and April of, of 1918 across the United States. Um, but we don't have a lot of civilian information for that first wave of pandemic influenza. And part of the reason for that, of course, is that um, influenza was not a reportable disease at the time. So public health departments, they saw influenza as not being a serious disease. They didn't require physicians to send reports in about influenza. So even if there was an uptick of, of, of civilian cases of influenza that spring, they simply were not being properly recorded. Um, but interestingly, you know, boarding schools were, were quite well documented because, of course, boarding school administrators were interested in student health and they had to report that data back to the Indian office. Um, and so Haskell actually, you know, kept very detailed records of this very early outbreak of influenza that happened in mid-March of 1918, um, just, you know, 11 days after the first reported ca- cases coming out of Camp Funston. Professor Adams says this influenza outbreak was really a shock to the school. The superintendent, H.B. Pierce, described the outbreak as coming like a thunderbolt out of a clear sky. (coughs) On March 15th, the first student came to the school hospital complaining of flu symptoms, headache, neck pains, extreme tiredness, sore throat, fever. Soon more students were coming to the school hospital with the same symptoms. And so within just a few days, uh, dozens of students were reporting to the school hospital. Um, and, and within a week, so many were sick at the school that the school had to shut down its academic part- departments and also its industrial departments. Um, and then within two weeks, uh, about half of the school's uh, 750 students were down with the disease, in addition to several uh, staff members and other employees at the school as well. So it was they were very hard hit very early on. So you describe in your research how the school's administration wasn't really prepared at all for an outbreak of this magnitude. So what did the administration try to do? So again, this, this came as a real shock. The superintendent, H.B. Uh, Pierce, was, he was you know, very perplexed, confused by what was going on. The school physician, Dr. Charles Ensign, um, also was very confused. The students had extremely high fevers, um, which meant that they required constant nursing. They had to get ice to try to bring down their temperatures. Um, This task was performed not only by the doctor, but also the school nurse. Um, There were also some students who were assisting in the school hospital, and they were also helping to take care of students. Um, And then other school employees were sort of drafted from all the academic and industrial departments as well to take care of all these six students. Um, But soon, you know, the the school was just overrun by, by the disease. The school hospital was designed to hold 50 patients, but soon there were over 200 students who needed hospitalization. They converted some of the dormitories into makeshift hospital rooms, but many of the caregivers were also getting sick, the school nurse and the assistant nurses who were also students. And it became really difficult to provide adequate care for all the sick people. This was all happening within just two weeks from the first case. Professor Adams says at this point, Superintendent Pierce sent an appeal out to the federal Indian office begging for their assistance, and he also hired an additional three nurses from Lawrence. Now, despite these efforts to secure additional help, uh, students did begin to die. So the first student who died was a a Chickasaw boy named Davis Bond, who was 16 years old. Um, His family was from Leonard, Texas. Um, He had come to the school to, to get his sort of high school education. And his death really came as a shock to the school. Again, this this happened um, not long after the outbreak. He, he died on March 24th. He hadn't seemed especially sick. He had, you know, he had had a what they called an attack of pneumonia uh, following his his bout of influenza, um, but had not appeared to be dangerously ill. But then suddenly took this turn for the worse and died within just a few hours of of taking this this turn for the worse. And in fact, he he died so quickly that uh, the Pierce didn't really have time to, to notify his parents in time to come and see him. So in fact, his parents received notification on the afternoon that he started to, to appear worse. Um, but by the time they, they received that information, he had already passed away. And so they, they ended up arriving at the school the day after he died. And then they just simply collected his body and took it back home for burial. And he was only the first. So after Davis Bond died, another uh, another six students died that spring. So this was Really horrific. So the spring wave of influenza at the Haskell Institute came on quick and strong. But by the second week of April, there are no new cases. It's gone away. 
Of course, part of what makes this Haskell Institute outbreak story so notable is that it's happening very soon after the Camp Funston influenza outbreak. So I asked Professor Adams how she thought the flu got to the Haskell Institute in March of 1918. Most likely, in my view, it probably came directly from Camp Funston. Um, those, you know, we, we know for sure that the flu was in Camp Funston by around March 4th. Um, and, you know, the fact that Haskell got, you know, got his first case by March 15th, that seems fairly likely they're, you know, they're both in Kansas. Um, and there was a lot of contact between the Haskell Institute and um, army bases, including Camp Funston. And that was because a lot of the students at Haskell were of military age or, or, or were of recruitment age. And so a lot of these boys were very eager to join the military. They were eager to fight for their country. Um, and a lot of these boys would go out on town leave. They would meet with army recruitment um, officers. Um, also, former students who had previously enlisted in the military would sometimes come back to Haskell to visit their friends and sometimes even brothers or sisters who were still students at the school. And so there were quite frequent visits from, from uh, military personnel. In addition, uh, relatives of uh, employees and staff members at the school would also come back to visit their family members um, from the army camps and bases. And I know from looking at uh, the school newspaper that reported uh, who was visiting the school at different times that the the, uh, the son of the assistant superintendent, who was named Lieutenant Albert Birch, he actually came and visited his parents from Camp Funston um, on, on the weekend of March 8th through 10th. It was not reported that Birch was feeling sick or anything during his visit, but it, but it is a possibility that kind of demonstrates these, these frequent contacts that the school had with these army bases um, that were also experiencing outbreaks of influenza. Of course, this is by no means the first outbreak of a communicable disease at the Haskell Institute. You mentioned in your research that disease outbreaks were fairly common at Haskell. So why is this? And is the spring 1918 flu outbreak any different than these other ones? Yeah, so disease outbreaks were fairly common occurrences at Indian boarding schools in this time period, so late 19th, early 20th centuries. And this is because these boarding schools were really unsanitary. They were overcrowded. Um, and also, this was also because at this time, there were just a lot of childhood diseases going around. This was an age before modern vaccinations and before antibiotics. Um, there were a few vaccinations available, things like smallpox, but not for, not for a lot of these childhood diseases like measles, mumps, rubella, and so forth and so on. In the 10 years prior to the pandemic, there had been an effort on the part of the Indian office to try to clean up the boarding schools. They, they began to recognize that this was a travesty, that children were dying at these alarming rates, and that, you know, how are they going to educate Indian children if the Indian children are, are not surviving their education? And so there was sort of a, a, an outcry by reformers, and so the Indian office began to take this more seriously. In response to this, Professor Adams explains that the Haskell Institute attempted to create a more healthy environment for the students by ventilating school buildings, disinfecting books and blankets, and constructing sleeping porches to help address overcrowding in the dormitories. And the school finally received its own resident doctor and resident nurse in the early 1900s. This meant students could undergo regular health inspections. One more time, please. Although it's unclear how effective these actually were. Good. Everything looks good. For example, Professor Adams describes a 16-year-old girl who died during the fall outbreak of the flu pandemic. After her death, it was discovered she was seven months pregnant. So while these school records claim they were doing regular health checks, it's kind of uncertain how thorough these checks were. But even with these procedures in place, diseases spread frequently through the Haskell Institute. So a part of the problem that schools were facing at this time was that they were chronically underfunded. So Congress was never appropriating enough money to actually serve these schools at, at, the, at the level that they needed to be served. Um, and so it, it became really difficult for, for school officials, superintendents to, to buy the supplies, to, to buy the sort of healthful food that they, they promised that they were serving students. But what made influenza, this influenza outbreak at Haskell in the spring of 1918 truly unique was just how many students and staff members it struck at once. And again, this happened very quickly. This was, you know, within a, a two week period, half the school is, is, is sick with influenza. To then have seven students die within three weeks was really um, something that they hadn't seen previously. Of course, we know that the more deadly second wave of the flu would spread across the U.S. later in the fall of 1918. So what happened at the Haskell Institute during this second wave? 
So influenza returned to the Haskell Institute around October 1st of 1918 for a second wave. Uh, and the big difference here, of course, is that by that time, influenza was widespread in the United States. And so uh, the superintendent, uh, Superintendent Pierce, and other school officials were not quite as shocked and surprised by influenza. So they had a better sense of what this was now. And in March, they had really had no idea what was happening and why they were being hit so, so hard by this disease. But by October, they, they understand what this is. They know this is Spanish flu. They're able to read U.S. Public Health Service uh, reports. They're able to ask in an office for advice about what to do. And that doesn't mean that they're better prepared to deal with it or to, to stop its spread, but at least they, they know what it is now, more or less. Um, so the disease, it still strikes the school very, you know, very hardly, very, very severely, and, and spreads rapidly throughout the institution. And sadly, the disease was even deadlier in the fall than it had been in the spring. Um, by the end of October, nine students had died at the school, and at least one more student had passed away after, after deserting Haskell and returning home to his family while he was sick with influenza. It seems the story of the Haskell Institute gives us one glimpse into how Native Americans were affected by the influenza pandemic. Can you give us a more general sense of how Native communities across the U.S. were affected by the flu? Yeah, so, so overall, Native people did suffer a higher mortality rates during the 1918 to 1920 pandemic than did the U.S. population at, at large. Um, so the population of Native people in the United States at the time uh, was re recorded as 320,000, more or less, and at least 78,000 Native people caught influenza and about 6,600 died from influenza. Now, these are the official reported numbers, and they're almost surely undercounts. And as we've seen recently with COVID-19, it's very difficult to keep accurate records of infections and deaths, and those are usually undercounted. Um, but even if these figures are at least somewhat accurate, it means that about 24% of the indigenous population in the United States caught influenza, and about 2.1% died. So indigenous people in the continental United States died at a rate nearly four times as high as the rest of the population. Professor Adams explains these high influenza death rates reflected multiple factors. Native peoples were severely impoverished, had high rates of unemployment, and experienced poor living conditions at the time of the flu pandemic. Many lived in crowded multi-generational homes where social distancing was hard and disease spread easily. And indigenous children were being put in overcrowded boarding schools where diseases ran rampant. Much of this situation was the result of the U.S. government's allotment policy of the late 19th and early 20th century, which abolished the practice of communally held land and forced Native Americans to adopt a system of private land ownership that, as Professor Adams puts it, really tore out the economic heart of Native America. All of these factors contributed to the poor overall health of Native Americans at the time. Um, so a lot of these, these Native people across the country were already suffering from pre-existing health conditions, especially um, infection with tuberculosis is really common um, in this time period for Native people. And so they're already suffering from a lung disease when influenza strikes. Um, and so I think this perhaps accounts for, for why mortality rates were so high. And then it's also about having access to care, right? So, so Indigenous people, for the most part in 1918, were living in very rural environments. Uh, reservations were far away from, from large population centers, which meant that they didn't always have access to medical professionals. And so I think um, sort of the suffering of Native people in 1918 was reflective of their, their overall poor living conditions in that time period, which was based on US federal Indian policy that had really marginalized and oppressed Native people in this time period. So clearly the marginalization of Native Americans significantly affected the way they experienced the flu pandemic. However, in your research, you also tell stories about the agency of Native Americans within these oppressive conditions. So how did parents and students at the Haskell Institute attempt to assert their power and make choices within this discriminatory system? Yeah, so by the time of the 1918 pandemic, um, federal officials they were supposed to get consent from Indian parents in order to transfer Indian children to these non-reservation boarding schools. So this was not something that was supposed to be coerced. Um, but in reality, you know, the economic conditions that were faced by many, many Native families made it very difficult for them to refuse to send their children to these schools. So, you know, they, they were maybe very impoverished back at home on the reservation and they thought, well, if they sent their children to school, at least the children would get regular meals and, and would maybe get a new set of clothes as well from the government. 
Uh, once parents agreed to send their children to these off-reservation boarding schools, they then signed a contract um, with the Indian office that more or less relinquished their parental rights during the duration of the contract period. And so this was usually about three to five years. And so superintendents of these schools essentially had the power to grant or to refuse students home leave. So they could decide, you know, in the summertime even, would the student be able to go home and visit their parents or would they maybe have to go and work on a white farm to get this so-called work experience um, to you know, become these productive American citizens as reformers like to think of it. And so this power that federal officials, these, these boarding school superintendents had over Indian students became especially apparent during the influenza pandemic, because as you can imagine, parents were terrified about the safety of their children. But Native parents and students did not just sit idly by, they fought back. Native parents wrote hundreds of letters to school officials demanding information about their children and asking to have their children sent home during the pandemic. The Indian office decided that they would not close the boarding schools during the flu pandemic, which led to a lot of stress between Native parents and these federal officials. So some parents just show up at Haskell to collect their children against the orders of the Indian office, which technically had the authority to keep their children at the school. There are also a number of cases where Haskell students resisted federal authority during the pandemic. So during the first week of the fall outbreak at Haskell, for example, at least three different students fled from the school. And then as the number of cases continued to grow at the school, so too did the number of desertions. Um, one of the fathers of two of these runaways, a man named Jesse Wap, explained to the superintendent that the children were running away from disease. They were literally running away from disease. Now, at least one of these these stories had a tragic end. There were two Potawatomi brothers, Leo and Richard Wap, um, who deserted from the school. But unknowing to them, they they had already uh, contracted the influenza before they left. And you know, by the time they returned home, uh, they were both sick with influenza. Um, and sadly, Richard uh, did die from influenza shortly after his his return home. So this is the the one student who who died um, after after returning home. But in other cases, you know, students did make it home to their families. And once they were home with their families, their parents were really unwilling to send them back to school. And so I think, you know, this is an example of, of parents and children resisting federal authority, which sort of complicates our narrative of, of federal Indian policy in this time period. Um, you know, the federal officials were trying their best to monitor and control uh, Indian peoples, students and their parents and their families. Um, and to, to mold them into these American citizens and, and to, to pressure them to, to follow these assimilationist agendas of federal officials. But indigenous peoples were doing their own things, right? They were, they were finding ways to push back against these policies and to make their own choices, even under these very difficult uh, conditions. So shifting topics a bit, you actually found something in your research that could question the role of the other Haskell, Haskell County, in the story of the flu pandemic. Historian John Berry, whom we talked to in a previous episode, claims it's possible that the spring influenza outbreak at Camp Funston originated in Haskell County, Kansas. And one of his pieces of evidence is that the U.S. public health reports in April of 1918 mentioned an influenza outbreak in, quote, Haskell, Kansas. So what is the connection here to the Haskell Institute outbreak? Now, scholars have long known that Haskell had an early outbreak influenza based on this weekly public health report that was published in early April of 1918. And then John Barry in his 2004 book, The Great Influenza, uh, ended up um, running with this idea. And he assumed that the Haskell referred to in this report was Haskell County. And so that became sort of the basis of, of him doing his research and looking into Haskell County to, to, to look for evidence of early cases of influenza in Haskell County. Um, but as I found with my research, the timing of this report on April 5th of 1918 makes it clear that the report was in fact referring to the outbreak at the Haskell Institute, which is in Douglas County, not Haskell County. So this was right around the time that the U.S. Public Health Service physician, Charles Banks, was at the school investigating conditions at the school. And so it makes sense that he would have been the one to, to write this report and, 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 and to the Surgeon General and put it in this public health reports. Now, that's not to say that there wasn't an early outbreak in Haskell County, too. It's very possible that, you know, as John Barry was doing his, his additional research, that he found evidence that there was an earlier outbreak in Haskell County. But what I am saying is that that U.S. public health report was referring to the Haskell Institute, not to Haskell County. So if there was an outbreak in Haskell County, it did not um, get that sort of national attention. 
So a final question, given we are facing another pandemic a century later, how do you think the experiences of Native Americans during the influenza pandemic compare to how Native communities are dealing with the COVID pandemic, especially given that Native Americans have been hit disproportionately harder by COVID? I started this project um, about, I guess I started research about four years ago, so I've been working on it for a while um, and just you know had no concept that we would now be living through a pandemic as well. Um, but there, there are some, you know, really shocking and, and surprising parallels between 1918 and what's happening today. Um, like the influenza pandemic of 1918, COVID-19 has hit indigenous communities particularly hard. Um, certain indigenous communities like the Navajo Nation and the Zia Pueblo have had among the highest infection rates in the country. So this has really been a devastating outbreak in Indian country. Uh, despite the modern economic successes of certain tribes, uh, especially with casino wealth, um, Indians as a whole remain the poorest population in the United States today. Um, so around one in four Native Americans live below the poverty line today. Uh, meanwhile, federal services for Indian people remain woefully underfunded. Um, and then uh, as a result of this sort of underfunding of Indian Health Service, uh, facilities are frequently under-equipped and they're understaffed. Um, Native people may, might also live hours away from the nearest Indian Health Service facility, uh, which makes it very difficult, if not impossible, for them to receive consistent, regular care and treatment. And so as a result of these multiple burdens of poverty, poor living conditions, inadequate medical care, and difficulty uh, accessing care, uh, Indian people today suffer disproportionately from chronic health problems, so things like diabetes and asthma and heart disease and liver and kidney diseases and autoimmune diseases are all you know, common afflictions in, in, in Native America. And so these pre-existing conditions of poor health have then left Native people especially vulnerable to the effects of COVID-19. And so we're seeing sort of a, a repetition of what happened in 1918 um, when you know, influenza struck these impoverished, underserved, um, you know, unhealthy communities that were suffering from the effects of you know, the all allotment policy. And, and therefore, you know, suffer even worse from influenza. And we're sort of seeing the same thing today with COVID-19, that COVID-19 has, has revealed and, and highlighted the ongoing suffering of Native people in modern America. The cemetery at Haskell Indian Nations University, the final resting place for over 100 students, starkly illustrates a much larger story about rampant disease, discrimination, and the absolute failure of the U.S. government when it comes to the health and well-being of Native American communities. This is a story that begins well before the 1918 flu and continues well into the 21st century with the COVID pandemic. However, the stories of parents and students at the Haskell Institute pushing back against the Indian office and white authorities at Haskell, running away from diseased institutions, literally and metaphorically, and asserting their agency and sovereignty, these are the stories we don't hear often enough about Native Americans in, quote, mainstream U.S. history, but these are the stories that most especially need to be told. You can hear more from Professor Eric Anderson, who we heard at the beginning of this episode, in our next mini-episode, where he gives us a fuller account of the history of the Haskell Institute and how it became today's Haskell Indian Nations University. And in our next main episode, we'll be telling the story of Dr. Samuel Crumbine, a national public health pioneer and Kansas Secretary of Health during the influenza pandemic. While his policies helped establish important public hygiene and sanitation practices and helped fight the spread of communicable diseases in Kansas, his legacy is certainly not without controversy. Thanks for listening to Pandemic on the Prairie. If you want to go further on this episode's topic and take a look at some of our sources, check out our website at www.1918flukansas.com. That's www.1918flukas.com. You can listen to all of our available episodes on the website, or you can listen and subscribe to Pandemic on the Prairie through your favorite podcast service, such as Apple Podcasts, Spotify, Google Podcasts, Amazon Music, and Stitcher. And please remember to leave us a review. See you next time. It was in 1919. Yes, men and women was that.